that he wanted. He created everything. He's in the garden with his creation. He's in the garden with those who are created in his image. But then he knows rejection. He knows sin. He knows death. He knows separation. But yet his greatest desire in the midst of that is still to be with his people. So he gives us the, the Emmanuel principle, God with us. And he sends Jesus. But even Jesus doesn't get the story that he wants. He's baptized. He starts his ministry. He goes out into the wilderness. He's tempted by Satan. He comes back. There's conflict. There's struggle. There's separation. There's abandonment. And then there's a cross where Jesus is crucified and he dies. You see, even Jesus doesn't get the story that he wants. But we all have a story. And even in our own lives, we don't get the story that we want. As Noah was praying earlier, there's addiction, there's family issues, there's employment issues, there's sickness. We don't have the story that we want. But here's the thing. Our stories matter. And when we decide to intersect, when we decide to intertwine our stories with God, with God's story, it starts to make a difference. And when we are willing to share our stories with other people, then our stories take on a whole new meaning as they impact the world around us, as they impact the people whom we do life with. You see, we are a church that does life together. And this morning, you're going to hear from three people whom we do life with week in and week out who have a story Their story isn't what they wanted, but they decided, they made the choice to intersect their story with God's story. And the minute that happened, amazing things begin to happen in the world around them as they realize their story has meaning as they share it with other people. So at this time, I want you guys to to give a Midtown welcome to Tiana Bancroft, to Brock Castaneda, And to Marnie Corsaro, would you guys welcome them up? As you guys begin to share your stories, would you just share with the people of Midtown your name and how long you have been part of Midtown? Testing, testing. All right. Hi, townies. <laughs> so for those of you I haven't met, I'm Tiana Bancroft. My husband, Josh, and I have been coming to Midtown for going on nine years. And we have two curly-headed blondes running around here on Sundays, Evelyn and Josh, Joshua. So um, like so many of you, I did not grow up in a Christian home. Outside of the use of profanity, Jesus' name was um, not something I heard regularly professed. Yet somehow as a child, I always um, somehow knew that God existed, but um, in my suffering and my loneliness, um, I was convinced that he had forgotten and forsaken me. I grew up the eldest of five kids to a mother that never wanted children and a father who couldn't cope. We grew up poor in every sense of the word. My belongings were often sold to uh, stave off the fury of my parents' drug dealers. Um, In search of the next fix, my siblings and I were often put in compromising situations, many of which resulted in me being sexually molested by the people who were entrusted with my care. Things like um, security, hope, and happiness 
were luxuries that we just simply couldn't afford. Um, fast forward to when I was 15, my mother said, um, the night before my brother's first birthday, my mother said she was leaving the house to um, pick up a birthday cake for him, and she never came back, which left me to raise my four siblings and to take the brunt of my father's emotional and physical abuse. Lies like, you're not worth staying for, you're alone, you'll never be a lot enough, um, they not only afflicted me, but they began to take root in my identity, affecting how I viewed myself and the world surrounding. In the scarring of those wounds, I became convinced that people would never understand the depravity of my upbringing and therefore could not be trusted with my lived experiences. The isolation that I thought would protect me um, eventually became a fortress to further enslave me and separate me from the love of Christ and the salve of his healing presence through others. So when I was praying about our time together this morning, I asked, Father, what do you want people to hear through my story? Sometime after, I believe the Holy Spirit said, talk about the common lie and the universal truth. So here it goes. The common lie of my story is that of the spirit of abandonment, which tries to convince me that my unworthiness is what disqualifies me from experiencing goodness in my life. To this day, I sometimes struggle um, with, I sometimes struggle to believe that which I didn't receive in my upbringing as I question my purpose, my efficacy, my value as a beloved daughter, a chosen companion, and a good, present, and needed mother to my children, especially as a mother. Josh and I have lost three babies to miscarriage throughout our marriage. Lost as if they were something trivial, like car keys or your favorite pen. The simplest and perhaps uh, the most honest word I can use to describe this experience is taken. Three babies, hopes of legacy and dreams fulfilled, tenderly wrapped in flesh that were unexpectedly and unapologetically taken from us. 2012, 2019, and again just a month ago as we said goodbye to another baby, we'd never meet the sight of heaven. Abandonment tried wreaking havoc on my soul again. Now comes time for the universal truth. <laughs> Deuteronomy 31, eight tells us, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be, be afraid and do not be discouraged. Our God is not surprised, nor is he uninformed of the enemy's tactics. He is all-knowing, all-seeing, and ever-present. He promised never to leave us or forsake us, and he keeps his promise through the birth, the death, and the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, whose name is also Emmanuel, which means God with us. You see, God isn't repelled by me, the brokenness of my past, or the present breaking of my still aching heart. Brokenness is the very thing that draws him to you and me. Through the shedding of his blood, Jesus testified that I'm not only worth staying for, I'm also worth dwelling in. So I can be confident as a mother, a daughter, a wife, and a friend because I am fathered by God. Truly, I tell you, my friends, what God chooses not to take away, he does redeem for good. Yeah. And Midtown, you've been a big part of the healing journey for me. In the safety of your acceptance, 
I've felt free to grieve, free to share, to serve, and to be known without fear of judgment or condemnation. You can't carry your cross until you surrender what's in your hands first. Mm -hmm. And you all have been instrumental in fostering an environment where that can take place for me. Thank you. You can't carry your cross until you first surrender what's in your hands. And we all, as we follow Jesus, we are called to carry our cross. Thank you for doing that so well and being a great example for us. All right, sir. Hi, everyone. My name is Brock Castaneda. Um, I've been coming to LifeGate for about five years or so, I think. Um, I'm married to Megan Castaneda and my daughter's Noah Castaneda. She runs around here from time to time. Um, uh, my story, uh, I was, I'm 35 years old. I, I'm from western Nebraska originally. I'm from Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. Uh, I have a half-brother and a half-sister who are 8 and 10 years older than me um, from my mom's first marriage. And I'm a twin, an identical twin. And um, being a twin, whether you want it or not, you get... It's funny, I looked right at Ben when I said that. Um, but you, you, you get attention whether you want it or not. Um, and uh, so we've always had a lot of, of attention on us, and I'm kind of an introvert, and I don't really like attention. I don't like being up here. Um, I don't like having a lot of attention on me. Uh, but I didn't, uh, I didn't grow up with a relationship with God. I didn't go to church uh, growing up. And uh, I would say, you know, in a, in a way of being honoring to my to my mother and father, I grew up in a difficult household. You know, there was there was infidelity, there was uh, physical and psychological abuse, and alcoholism, and fighting, and financial insecurity, and it was just a it was a difficult environment to grow up in um, for sure. And then with no God, you know, no church, no community, we were very isolated in that that way as well. Um, you know, alcoholism and drug addiction run rampant in my family. Uh, I, I have it. Um, my twin brother, my dad, uh, my grandma, all her brothers. It would be easier to tell you, I guess, who doesn't have it. There's like three of them that don't have it, basically. And I, I got it as well. Um, and, uh, you know, something that, that was, I think, pretty impactful in my life that I didn't realize until a recent therapy session was um, I was bullied really badly growing up as well, and what an impact that's had on my life going forward. And, uh, you know, you asked me to elaborate a little bit on what that was like, so it kind of started in grade school and middle school where, you know, I'm, I'm a quarter Mexican and then three quarters Caucasian, so when you're, you're, you have both of those things, it's kind of hard to fit in sometimes, you know, when you're a kid especially. Um, so you kind of get rejected by both sides and so every day when I, was, when I would go to school, there was always, I was kind of under the threat of physical violence and, um, cause that would happen in my school, you know, like people would get, it was bad. And so every day when I, I hated going to school cause I just didn't know if I was gonna be uh, attacked and humiliated. And um, so what I did is I, I built myself up as this, this tough guy and um, I realized how much I've carried that forward into my, my adulthood as well. Um, also, you know, when I, when I was in high school, I became an, an atheist, and it wasn't like I decided I was going to do it. It was just a natural thing for me. I just, whenever I prayed when I was a kid, I just never really thought that, that anybody was listening. And uh, I've always been kind of a linear scientific thinker, and I was like, I've never experienced it. I've never, you can't test it, you know, that... Uh, so I, I just didn't believe, and then I became the person who would, who was that guy who would argue with you and tell you that you were, you're dumb for believing what you believed, and and I, I swung completely to the other side and just became really proud of you know how smart I was and how how not smart other people were, and I was really mean about it. Um, I, uh, I also wanted to rebel, you know, we're all rebellious at that time too, and so that was a good way for me to, to rebel as well. Um, and then in 2007, we moved to Omaha, 
And I just remember thinking, like, when I moved to Omaha, I can do whatever I want. I can do anything I want. And that really began my, my life of, of hedonistic living, you know. And, and you asked me to define what that meant for me. And that's just living purely for, fi- for physical and psychological pleasure, uh, doing anything that I wanted, completely driven by my impulses. I had no tether to any kind of morality or to, to God or a way of living. Um, and that's when I, I became an alcoholic and a drug addict, and, and that was for about five years um, from the ages of about 19 to 24. And uh, I went ahead and switched the work schedule and the, the drinking schedule, so I drank for about five days a week and then worked for two. <laughs> so I, uh, and then I actually even drank the two days that I was at working, too. So, um, you know, at first, that was, that was honestly, it was really fun. Um, I really enjoyed that. And the people that I met and the situations you get into. And, and for me, when I, when I drank, it was like all the, I experienced relief, you know. Like I, it made me feel connected to people. It made me feel connected to myself. It made me live in the present moment. Um, I wasn't terrified all the time. And it, it, it really helped me, you know. And then, you know, you build up tolerances. So you need more and more and more. And that has consequences to it, you know, when you wake up in the morning and you had 20 drinks the day before and, and just like the, the pain, the physical, and I already have anxiety. So you like, you put that on top of it. And there were, there were a lot of times where I just didn't want to go on living anymore. You know, like I just, I didn't, I didn't want to, to commit suicide, but I just wanted it to end. I didn't want that life to continue to go on anymore. Um, and I lived like that for a long time. And I, I really, um, I wanted help but I just didn't have the courage and the willingness to go seek it for myself. So in 2012, I was, I was driving and uh, I'd been drinking and I got pulled over and I saw the the lights and I was just like, finally, somebody caught me. And finally I have to, I have to do something about this, you know? And uh, that's when I entered into a a 12 step program and uh, last place I ever expected to find God, but I found God in there because I just knew, I I looked at my problem and I knew there's no way I can do this. There's no way that a a human being can do this. I don't think there's any therapist or medication. And that program tells you it's about God. God has to do it. So that's where I I found God in that program. Um, But then I met my wife, Megan, and she brought me here. And that's, you know, I, I met Jesus through this church and through her. And uh, it was, it, I looked at her and I looked at the way that she lived her life. And I said, if this is, if this is what a Christian is, if this is a person, then that's what I want, you know. And because uh, she's not your typical Christian. <laughs> she just, she's so great. And, you know, I, I found... She's so, she's so great. Um, I just, I didn't, I, I never, I, and I had a lot of intellectual pride to get over, you know, because I'd been that guy for so long where I'm like making fun of people. I'm like, I can't become a Christian. I've been making fun of Christians for like 10 years straight. And uh, she helped me get over that, you know. Um, she really did. <laughs> so <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Um, and then kind of, kind of, (laughs) kind of like, um, what Tiana said, you know, the thing that popped up for me was the, the story of the prodigal son. And, uh, the, the part of that story that's really stood out to me as I've thought through this process is the inheritance. And I was in that way, I wanted my inheritance early that I was that I wanted it early. I misunderstood what the inheritance was. And so I, I wanted all good things in life. I wanted salvation. I wanted peace. I wanted all good things. I wanted it apart from God, and I wanted it on my own terms. So I went out and lived my life. Uh, wild living would be a good way to describe what I did. Um, and it completely destroyed me, you know. And uh, when I came back, he was waiting for me and ready to heal me and ready to redeem me. Um, and so he's, he's fixing our relationship, not on his end, but on my end. And I'm completely learning how to, to rely on God. Um, I haven't, I've, I've been sober that whole time since I, I entered that program, which has been 11 and a half years. And I, um, thanks. 
And, uh, you know, to answer your question about how he's, he's using me, he uses me in that 12-step that program. Um, through that, I've, I've learned how to be vulnerable as a man. I've learned how to, to surrender, to not take myself so seriously. And my life depends on, you know, he gave me a, a condition where my life depends upon uh, living the right way. And for a guy like me, honestly, if you don't put my life on the line, I'm probably not going to do it. So... Um, I'm really, I'm really grateful for that. So, uh, yeah, he just, you know, through, through the church, he, he's now, he's using, it's really nice because like I've, all I've ever done really is screw my life up and make huge mistakes. And now God's using those to help other people, which is, you know, it's the way he does it. So. Hi, I'm, <laughs> I'm Marnie Corsaro. He did. Corsaro's in the house. <laughs> I'm Marnie Corsaro, and my husband, Rob, and I have been coming here for two years this August. All right, so here's my story. I'm the oldest of four kids and was raised Roman Catholic and went to parochial school for eight years. So here's my disclaimer. My Catholic story is part of my overall story, and it's not all bad news. So I want to get that straight, right? That's my disclaimer. My Catholic education was part of my foundational, foundational love for Jesus. We all clear here? We're not bashing Catholics. Okay. Beautiful. All right, so I asked a ton of questions in school. And I absolutely exasperated my teachers. And let me tell you, Sister Viola in the third grade telling you that you have to read the entire Bible in order before you read Revelations is going to stick with you a long time. I just read Revelations about four years ago. Um, I stopped asking questions in about sixth grade, which is a really formative time in Catholic education. I had a teacher completely squelch any desire I had to ask questions because she told me I was ruining my chances at becoming confirmed, which was really painful. And she said my faith life must not be in order because I was asking so many questions. It's kind of heavy, right? And I wasn't about to disappoint my parents or make them mad at me. So I just got really quiet in school and read a lot on my own. And at about that same time, my mom was working swing shift and my dad worked mid shift. So for the most part, I was taking care of my brothers and sisters who were about six, eight. Well, they weren't about. They are six, eight, and ten years younger than me. And I just really made up things as I went along, right? I was a kid, winging it. And my dad worked like an absolute dog, right? He made sure we had the whole roof over our heads, dinner on the table, and hours and hours of overtime and side hustles, which were not called side hustles at the time, right? This isn't like the late 70s, early 80s. But he had an incredible work ethic and sense of family responsibility and faith. And my mom, I just think she was over her head in having so many kids at an early age and being in her second marriage. I was from her first marriage. And her struggles and anger came out in physical and emotional abuse towards me. Now, I didn't figure it out until years later that I think I was just a, a tangible, let me find my words here. I was a constant reminder for her of her past life. And that's why the anger and abuse happened, and that's all a story for another day, right? But, right, 
someone who should have really been the person I trusted most in my life. I couldn't trust her. And that made me quiet and independent and really way too self-reliant, like self-reliant to a fault. I'm sensing a theme here, by the way. We did not know each other's stories. I didn't mean to spoil it, Tim, but I'm very moved by hearing you too. And during that time, it never occurred to me to pray for guidance or for safety or any of that, which is weird because I went to Catholic school, being surrounded by nuns and priests and things like that. Um, oddly enough, I had instruction to pray to St. Jude to find a lost sweater or to pray for vocations. That's a thing. I'm probably driving you sound guys nuts. I'm so sorry. <laughs> My point here is, is I hadn't developed a relationship with Jesus. Right? He was just sort of intangible up there and kind of punitive, and I wasn't worthy of him. And because my educators were telling me I was asking too many questions, and maybe my faith life wasn't amazing, there was something wrong with me. And because of my home life situation, not being the greatest, if you know what I'm saying there over the glasses, right, there must be something wrong with me too. So I was like, hmm. I'm really not sad about it now, and I don't regret it. It's just something that happened, and I've moved forward from there. It's part of my story, right? But at the time, it did not feel amazing. So anyway, I made it to seventh grade, and that confirmation thing I was talking about earlier. So in Roman Catholic education and instruction, according to the Conference of Catholic Bishops, Confirmation is when a baptized person, this is a direct quote, by the way, um, is when a baptized person is sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit and is strengthened for service to the body of Christ. I, I really don't know what that means. Even today, I mean, I have a, a clue. But to a seventh grader in 1983, that meant I could pick a patron saint for my namesake and make a really awesome stole out of felt. <laughs> right, so I picked Joan of Arc. I picked Joan of Arc because I admired her strength. I admired her independence and freedom and the protection that she gave others. And she also had visions of divine inspiration. Now that I think about it as an adult, I was looking for strength in the voice of Jesus. That's what I was looking for. So I kept on in my life, taking care and protecting my brothers and sisters, doing well in school, reading a lot of books, and probably being outwardly quiet, independent, and overly self-reliant, or so I thought. Really, God was protecting me along the way. Um, I thought that Jesus was being punitive and disconnected and intangible, but he was really by my side that entire time. And by that point, I figured I'd really spurned him because I had departed from Catholicism and really had it coming at that point. I don't feel that way now, but I sure felt that way then. And then I grew up, I met my amazing husband, Rob, tricked him into marrying me. <laughs> we have two amazing children who are now grown and here with us today. Um, she has started her family with two amazing granddaughters. Well, they're my granddaughters, her daughters. And he is starting his family. And I continue to pray with thanks and gratitude every day for the blessings of family, especially considering where I came from, right? Family at its core is incredible to me, this to everybody, but really important to me. And that whole self-reliance independence thing, um, let me tell you something about that. Um, it, it's really become a beacon for people, 
Like people think you really have it together when you're independent, but it doesn't mean you have it together. Um, they come to you for advice or assistance, which I will gladly give, um, even if it's, if it's just a friendly ear, but it's somebody else really guiding that advice and assistance, right, coming through us. It's not me. I didn't figure that out for a long time. Um, and it's kind of lonely. It feels really lonely. So how did I get here today? I, I started listening and hearing Jesus. I'm not kidding. I started listening and being really aware of how Jesus is with me every day in interactions with people in those small ways, those more intimate ways. Like I'm, I'm not going along life and getting a giant lightning bolt. It's in those little interactions with people, seeing the shift or the relaxation in their shoulders where you're making a difference in those interactions with other people. That's where I see it. Um, you know, I, I, Rob and I walked into the church here two years ago during our granddaughter's baby dedication, having not really gone to church regularly for years. And we were really moved by the experience and thought, let's come back. And we came back that following Sunday. And Tim came up and spoke to us after service. And it was just kind and welcoming. And everybody here has just been amazing. Um, but in all seriousness, I've learned more from reading the Bible the last two years and coming here to worship and seek nights and strengthen my relationship than probably the whole rest of my life. And that comes from understanding that Jesus is by my side and I appreciate the freeness and acceptance that I've experienced here. So glad you came here. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> so as I've been listening to your stories, uh, and as I read them earlier this week, there's a common theme that stands out, and I think it's a theme that all of us will ex have experienced in our lives, and that's the suffering. Suffering is part of our walk with Jesus. Unfortunately, you know, if we're called to be like him, do what he did, Jesus was a man of suffering suffering on the cross to the point of death. So our life is going to be about suffering as well. And it's not fun. But in the midst of this suffering that we have, and you guys are speaking to this when you share your part of your story about God, you know, we have a hope. We have a hope in our lives in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our struggles, in the midst of the stories that we don't want. We have a hope. And how many of you know that we have a living hope? Peter says that we have a living hope in Jesus Christ who was resurrected from the dead. And in the midst of our stories, in the midst of our struggles, we have hope. And that's good news, amen? Yeah. Amen. So uh, for you guys, we often talk at, at Midtown and LifeGate overall. You'll hear Pastor Micah say, we want to become more like Jesus for the good of others. So in your lives, how has God used your story for the good of others? Uh, well, Psalm 34 is one of my favorites, and I often reflect on it. But um, in it, Psalm, 4, excuse me, Psalm 34, verse 18 declares, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Uh, my story testifies that his word is truth. And that suffering that Tim's referring to and that we've all spoke of, it can blind us to truth, but it can also exist as a, a means for us to receive it. I'd like to think that my story encourages people to reflect on their own circumstances and ask the Lord to give them eyes to perceive his closeness uh, in their lives too. I think one of my favorite things is being part of people's aha moments where they're able to sort through the muck of their own stories and begin seeing the heart of the Father anew. 
he's, uh, he's let me make so many mistakes that if I, <laughs> if somebody needs help, I've probably made the mistake that they've made. So um, he's also kind of unique me, uniquely qualified me to help people specifically with addiction issues, you know, and uh, he's also just humbled me to the point so much that um, I feel very comfortable being being vulnerable um, in groups of men and around other people. Uh, but I, you know, I just I broke myself down to such a point that that now I can see he he's restored the goodness and all the mistakes that I've made. He's restored the goodness in it, and and allowing me to share that with other people that are going through it as well. That's so good. Um, I'm historically a very private prayer, and I have had people ask me to pray with them at work, oddly enough, that I would never have expected to do. That's great. Yeah. All right, one more question for you, a challenging question. And then we're going to open it up to the audience, okay? <laughs> I'm kidding. It's not going to happen. <laughs> uh, yeah. You can see Tiana's eyes go. <gasps> uh, so as you think about your stories, and you, as you think about that moment where you said, I want my story to interact with your story, God. What is one word that you would use to describe that interaction, that intertwining of your stories? I love this story, or this, this question, and I also want to say thank you on behalf of all the introverts that you are not making them answer this. <laughs> um, but my one word would be adopted. That's good. How about you, Brock? For a guy like me to be up here and to have the life that I have, the word would be miraculous. Ah, so good. Miss Marnie? Um, amazing. Amazing. Yeah. That's so good. How about you all? You know, some of you may not have even done this yet, have let your story intertwine with God's story, but what would that one word you would use to describe your intertwining, your story intertwining with God's story. Don't answer that yet. I want you all to send me an email. Send me an email this week. It says, Tim, this is the word. This is the word that I would use. thall at discoverlifegate.com. I'll respond to your email too. Hey, can we give it a, another hand to these three right here? Yeah, you guys are good. If you have questions for them, they're going to be at the back of the sanctuary. Go up, shake their hand. It takes a lot of courage to come up here and share their testimony, their story as well. So they'll be in the back of the sanctuary just for you to ask a question, say how you're doing, introduce yourself as well. But as we wrap up our time, I want to leave you with these words from the writer of Hebrews. The writer writes, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witness. Now, a witness is somebody who can testify. A witness is somebody who has a story. The writer goes on to say, let us throw off everything that hinders us. How many of you know that we have a life, a calling in our life is a calling to endure, to persevere? So we throw off everything that hinders us, that sin that so easily entangles us. It says, let us run with perseverance the race marked for us. And we all have a race. We're all running a race. And that race is our story. So my question to you in this moment, the writer says, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witness. Who is in your cloud? Who are you doing life with day in and day out? Who are the people that are shaping you? Who are the people that are sharing their story? Who are the people that are, you are sharing your story with? Who are those people that are walking with you, encouraging you, loving you? Who are there for you? You see, church, we are not meant to do life alone. We are meant to do life together. So who is in your cloud? But there's a second question that comes with that as well. Not only who is in your cloud, but whose cloud should you be in? Who's that person that you need to walk with? 
Who's that person you need to encourage? That person you need to love? Whose person do you need to help shape their story? In short, whose story are you part of? People need people. People need you. People need your story. And so often our stories are not what we want, so we hide from them. We live in shame, and we refuse to share that. We think it doesn't matter. We think our story doesn't have meaning, but friends, our stories have meaning. And when we interact our stories with God's story, our stories become great. And when we're willing to share our stories with other people, our stories have meaning. So who's in your cloud? And whose cloud are you in? Everybody has a story. Your story matters. And so do the stories of other people. And our stories, they become great when we entwine them with God. And our stories, they have meaning when we share them with other people. So this week, listen to a story and share your story. Let's pray. God, you're so good. Father, we, just, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that we get to come together as your body and we get to do life together. We get to be in authentic relationships, not just with you, Jesus, but with those around us as well. And God, as we go this morning, I just pray that there's a difference, there's a movement in each of our hearts this morning. One that, that says, I need you. And you need me. Let me hear your story. And I want to share my story with you. God, thank you that we get to intertwine our story with the greatest story. That's your story, God. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.